Hey, second and third graders. I'm going to start a new read aloud book and I'm going to exit the screen as I talk here so you can see the cover. It's called The Dragon in the Sock Drawer. That's our new book. It's part of a series called the Dragon Keeper series. And this is book one. If you've had me as a teacher before last year, you've probably heard this book, which probably means that you love this book because it's one of the very best ones we have in all of the school. If you haven't had me, you're going to really, really enjoy it. Don't be disappointed if you've heard it before, because my plan is, as you get to hear this wonderful story again, is once we finish, we're going to move on to book two, which I don't think anybody's read and I haven't read, so I'm excited for that. So sit back, relax, enjoy. Our first chapter today is chapter one, is called The Thunder Egg. On the first day of summer, Jesse, his cousin Daisy, and Uncle Joe went to High Peak. Uncle Joe had come to look for rocks. Jesse and Daisy mostly come for the ride. Upon reaching the windy summit of High Peak, Jesse took one look at the view and bent over to pick up a rock. It made him feel dizzy to look down from the mountain, which was doing a pretty good job of living up to its name. Besides, maybe the rock would actually weigh him down, enough to keep him from blowing away. From Gold Mine City, a big name for a small town, High Peak was sometimes visible. It rose in the distance like a delicious dessert topped with whipped cream. The whipped cream was snow, which was always there, even on the hottest day of the year. Jesse was on the mountain for the first time. Up close, the snow didn't look as good. It looked sort of crusty and dirty, and it was much colder on the mountaintop than it was down in Gold Mine City. Jesse's sweatshirt was not doing much to keep him warm. Jesse had been living in Gold Mine City with Daisy, Uncle Joe, and Aunt Maggie since Easter vacation in March. His parents were in Africa setting up a children's clinic in a village in Tanzania. Jesse had traveled with his parents his whole life, but on his 10th birthday, he decided he wanted to go live in America. He wanted to eat American food, go to an American school, and have adventures with Daisy, his favorite cousin, who he had been visiting three weeks every summer his whole life. These days, Jesse wore two watches on his left wrist, one with a blue band and one with a black. The watch with the black band told him the time in Gold Mine City. The watch with the blue band told him the time in Tanzania. It was two o'clock here, midnight there. He imagined his parents asleep beneath mosquito netting in their hut, surrounded by snakes as long as cars and bugs as big as chipmunks. On the whole, even the extreme elevation, he was happier here with Daisy. Jesse went to see where Daisy was sitting to find out what she was doing. Anyone seeing them together would think they were friends rather than family because they looked nothing alike. They were both 10 years old, but Jesse was small for his age and sturdy with brown eyes and shaggy brown hair. Daisy was fair-haired, tall, and thin. The wind whipped her hair, which was as pale and fine as corn silk. The tips of her ears, which poked through her hair like elves, were bright pink. The tip of her nose matched. Daisy looked up and smiled at Jesse through blue lips and coal. Then she went back to sketching a flower that was poking out of the snow. Her pencil was sticking out of the sleeve of her sweatshirt, which she had pulled over her hand to keep it warm. A wildflower handbook was open. Its pages weighted down at the edges with small stones. Her eyes went from flower to sketch to handbook and back again. What rocks were for her father, flowers were for Daisy. She liked to say, not knowing the names of flowers is like not knowing the names of your brothers and sisters. What kind is it? asked Jessie. I'm pretty sure it's Prunella vulgaris, she said. It's totally magical. It's a folk name for self-heal. Cool, Jesse said. What does it heal? The Native Americans used to put it on boils, she said. Boils? Gross. 
Daisy carefully picked the flower and laid it between the pages of her notebook. Right next to her sketch, she printed the name in neat block letters beneath the sketch and turned the page. At home, she would transfer the specimen to her wildflower press, and when it was dried, she would frame it. She had over 20 varieties of wildflowers framed, her contribution to their museum of magic. The two cousins' way of keeping in touch over the years had been by reading the same books of fantasy. They were convinced sooner or later they would have a magical adventure of their own. While they waited, they saw magic in everything around them. Flowers and seashells and birds, animals, even old bottles or doorknobs. Daisy gave Jesse a side look. You okay? she asked. She knew about his fear of heights. On the hike up the mountain, she stopped practically every tenth step to ask him the same thing. Jesse nodded and held up his rock to show her that he was keeping busy. Daisy had already moved on to her next wildflower. Jesse closed his eyes and thought about the email message he would write his parents when he got back home. Dear Mom and Dad, I finally got to High Peak. It's pretty high for an old volcano, but it's frozen stiff now. The snow looks sort of like whipped cream. Jesse stopped cold. Let me out! Jesse's eyes snapped open. The voice sounded close and far away at the same time, like the music leaking out of someone's headphones. Jesse looked around. Daisy and Uncle Joe were the only other people on the mountain. Uncle Joe was bending over, tapping a boulder with a pickaxe. Daisy was flipping back and forth in her handbook. Then Jesse saw a man standing not far away. He was poking around with a stick, the tail of a long black coat trailing in the snow. He was a bit strange looking, but he clearly wasn't calling to Jesse. Jesse! There it was again. Jesse! Let me... Out! <coughs> Jesse looked down. Either he was going crazy or the voice was coming from the rock in his hand. He held it up to his ear. <coughs> Let me out, said the rock. Or was the voice coming from something inside the rock? Jesse held the rock at arm's length and stared at it. Uncle Joe liked to say, if you see a rock that talks to you, pick it up and bring it home. Jesse had always been pretty sure that Uncle Joe did not mean this for real. But now, he wondered. The rock looked normal. It was round and nubby, the color of oatmeal, with blackberry bits, including a leafy green part. It was warm from the sun and fit in his hand like a softball. Jesse, tiger, said the rock. Huh? What do you say? He whispered to the rock. Almost nobody knew Jesse's middle name was Tiger. Jesse! Tiger! The rock said again, vibrating in his hand. Days? He called out to his cousin, holding the rock up over his head. This rock! He stopped. He didn't know how to put it. He didn't want her to think his fear of heights had made him go wacky or something. Then again, maybe that's what was happening. Daisy looked, took one look at the rock, then leapt up and ran to him. She did a dance like a happy little prospector who just struck gold. Jesse, she said, you found one, a thunder egg. She pounded him on the back. Uncle Joe was always talking about thunder eggs. There were lots in the area. They were also called geodes, and they were filled with agate. When you cracked one open, there were beautiful crystals inside. Do thunder eggs talk? Jesse asked, trying to make his question sound kind of like a joke. Daisy grinned at him and gave him a playful shove. Sure they do. This one's saying, take me home, Jesse. Take me home and open me up. Come on, let's show my pops. She drugged Jesse over to Uncle Joe. Poppy, look what Jesse just found. When Uncle Joe saw Jesse's rock, he straightened up, then took off his cap, 
tugged his long gray ponytail. His cap was purple with the words Rockstar inscribed in orange letters on the bill. It was a funny joke if you were a geologist like Uncle Joe. Sure looks like a geode to me, said Uncle Joe. Congratulations, Jess. She's a beauty. Jesse squinted at his uncle. How do you know it's a girl? Cause, Uncle Joe said with a wink, I speak the secret language of rocks. And how come this rock is talking to me instead of you, Jesse wanted to ask, but he didn't say anything. Instead, he wrapped the thunder egg in clean blue, a clean blue bandana and gently placed it in the pouch of his sweatshirt. Okay, guys, said Uncle Joe. He put his cap back on. I think we can call it a day here. Let's head back down and take Jesse's thunder egg to the rock shop. They made their way across the summit, back to the hiking path, and past the strange man in the black coat, who stopped poking with his stick and stared at them as they went by. The sun was glinting off his wire-rimmed glasses and made him look eerily like he didn't have eyes at all. Jesse quickly looked away. In the pouch of his sweatshirt, the thunder egg zapped him hard, and he yelled. Daisy turned and gave him a look. You sure you're okay? I'm fine, he said, face burning. The rock shop was an old garden shed behind the house. It had a work table, shelves for the, ro shelves for the rocks, filing cabinets for notes, and all the tools of Uncle Joe's trade, including a special one for cutting, cutting open thunder eggs. Uncle Joe had cut open thousands of thunder eggs in his life, but he still got a kick out of it. He put on his goggles and heavy work gloves before picking up his big bandsaw. Jesse wasn't convinced that cutting open the rock was the right thing to do. What if that hurt what was ever was inside? He covered his mouth, pretending to stifle a yawn as he whispered to the thunder egg. You okay with this? The thunder egg vibrated warmly in his hand. Jesse decided to take that as a yes. Jesse was still hesitant to hand the rock over to his uncle. You'll be careful, won't you? Jesse said. I mean, this won't hurt or anything or damage the crystals, will it? Uncle Joe smiled kindly. I won't harm a single one, I promise. He held out a gloved hand. Jesse gave her cousin a gentle shove. Come on, Jesse Tiger, let's get a look at those crystals. Goggles first, said Uncle Joe. Daisy went to the shelf and got two pair. She tossed one to Jesse. He almost dropped them. Because just then the rock hissed, Jess, Jess, Jess. Jesse's glance slid from Daisy to Uncle Joe. Neither of them seemed to hear the rock. Arms trembling, Jesse handed the thunder egg to Uncle Joe. He winced as he set it between the iron jaws of the vise. He winced again as Uncle Joe spun the bolt and tightened the jaws to the thunder egg. Stand back, said Uncle Joe. Jesse and Daisy took one step away from him. Uncle Joe picked up the saw, turned on the motor. It roared to light. Then Uncle Joe put the whirling blade to the top of the rock. Wait! Jesse hollered over the noise. Uncle Joe looked up, switched off the saw, and pushed up his goggles. What is it, Jess? Jesse faltered. It seems like a pretty delicate thing, he said. I really, really don't want to hurt it. Daisy rolled her eyes. Poppy's cut open a million rock. I think he knows what he's doing. Uncle Joe spoke calmly. How about this? How about if I use a machine to cut a shallow groove in the rock? Then I'll turn it off, and we can crack it open the rest of the way by hand, carefully with a small chisel. Jesse's chest heaved with relief. He nodded gratefully. Thanks, Uncle Joe. Sounds good. Uncle Joe smiled at Jesse. Okay if I switch on the saw? Sure, said Jesse. Go ahead. But he regretted the decision as soon as the rock screamed again over the noise of the saw. Just as Jesse was about to lunge over Uncle Joe, he, the saw coughed and made a cracking sound. Uncle Joe switched it off. Huh, well I'll be, 
he said, looking at the, holding up the saw so Jesse and Daisy could see. The blade split right in two. Jesse and Daisy stepped to the work table. The egg didn't even have a nick. That's okay, said Jesse. I don't have to see the crystals. We just need a blade with some bigger teeth, Daisy said. We're going to open this stubborn old thunder egg up, won't we? Uncle Joe took out the old broken blade and fit a new one in with teeth the size of a big dog. Daisy pulled Jesse back to where they were standing. Jesse wanted to rescue the rock, but he was afraid Daisy and Uncle Joe would think he was nuts. Uncle Joe put the saw to the rock again. The saw howled like a hound dog. Or was it the rock howling? Smoke poured out of the saw. Uncle Joe turned it off again and waved away the smoke. I hope I'm not burning out the motor, he said. I wouldn't want you to do that, Uncle Joe, said Jesse. Thanks for trying. Now he felt as if the voice inside was being a poor guest. Did it or did it not want out? And if it did, why wasn't it cooperating? And why was it being so hard on Uncle Joe's equipment? Can we just try one more time, Poppy? Daisy pleaded. Uncle Joe sighed. Then he put the biggest, sharpest, strongest blade he had on. It had long, jagged teeth, like a hyena. Daisy pulled Jesse back one more step. Uncle Joe switched on the saw. This time, when the blade touched the rock, purple and green sparks flew every which way. The machine shrieked like a banshee. The blade exploded, sending bits of sharp metal flying as the rock shot out of the vise. The cousins yelped and dove for cover. The rock flew clear across the room and crashed through the window. And that is the end of chapter one, second and third graders. Tomorrow's chapter, chapter two, is called The Million Dollar Car.